Welcome to another moment in the Word. Are you a Christian? Are you a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, how would other people know that? How do others know that you're a Christian? The answer to that question is found in John chapter 9 and looking at verses 28 and 29. And it reads like this. Then they reviled him, and they said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from where he is. Well, it's really interesting. In the passage in the Greek, that first word then does not exist. But it's immediately following verse 27 where this man asks two questions. And he says, I have already told you, but you're asking me again. Why are you asking again? The second question is, do you want to also be his disciples? And so that causes them to be infuriated. That word also, that he is a disciple of the Lord Jesus. And they, and the word is reviled. Now that word revile is a very strong word in the Greek. It is the word that they heralded insults to him. They vilified him. That it was a, a very slanderous uh, insult that they were responding, reacting back to. The word is actually used, this Greek word, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Tanakh. And that verb is used in reference to the people's murmurings in the wilderness. That, in fact, it was an act of rebellion. That word of murmuring that Paul then refers to that they murmured Ten times, that's the word. They reviled. They reviled Moses. They were angry with Moses that he had brought them out of bondage into the wilderness, and they thought to die. That is the word that's used here. And perhaps John has picked that word because, in effect, what they are now doing is reviling against this man who is a disciple of Jesus, and they're really reviling against Jesus. Now, how does Jesus respond when he was reviled? We find Peter that's actually the one who talks about that. He says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 23, when he was reviled, same Greek word, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him that judges righteously. So how do people know that you're a Christian? They will know by how you respond when you're reviled, when you're accused, when you're vilified, when you're slandered. And how you respond will demonstrate that love overcomes hatred. Good overcomes evil. That's what Paul calls us to in Romans chapter 12. But Peter goes on and he says, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 now. And he says, don't return evil for evil. Or reviling for reviling. Same Greek word. But put on contrary blessing. Knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit blessing. In other words, one of the first characteristics is love. Jesus said, by this, all men shall know you're my disciples by your love. Love for one another for certain, but love for those even that hate you. Why? Jesus said, I didn't come into this world to condemn the world. The world's already condemned. I came into this world to seek and to save. And Jesus came to save those who were persecuting him, those that were violating him, those who were saying all manner of evil against him, those who would eventually crucify him. And he's hanging on the cross, and his first words are, Father, forgive them. People know you're a Christian by your love toward your adversaries. But notice now, they go on to say, 
and said, you're his disciple. Now, there's two things more that is revealed here. They know that this man is his disciple, Jesus' disciple, because of his boldness. He's not cringing. He's not cowardice. He's not uh, servile in his response like uh, so many of the Pharisees' followers. No, this man is standing boldly. He's not like his parents that are silent and pushing the, the buck on to somebody else. Instead, no, he is responding. And the second thing now, wisdom. The manner in which he responds. And notice every question that they ask. His response is with wisdom. Wisdom that does not come from learning and from studying, but from the Holy Spirit. I remind you of the time that Peter and John are in the uh, temple area and, and they just healed somebody and, and the uh, Pharisees and the priests, they tell Peter and John that they're not supposed to be doing that. And it says they took notice when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, un unlearned men, and they marveled. And then they realized that they had been with Jesus. So I want to suggest to you there's three things that identify us as disciples of Jesus. First of all, our love even for those who don't love us. Number two, for boldness. And the early church prayed for boldness, that they would speak forthrightly the truth in love. And then thirdly, for wisdom. Wisdom that does not come from learning, but from the Holy Spirit. So they say, you're his disciple. They mean that actually as a put down. In reality, it was the greatest compliment that could ever be made that you and I are called disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because remember who Jesus is now. Jesus is God who has come in the flesh. They say, on the other hand, we're Moses' disciples. Now, this contrast between the disciples of Jesus and the disciples of Moses is the great divide between Judaism today and Christianity. It's a matter of authority. It's a question of whose side are you on, as if they're in conflict. Now, in reality, they're not. John makes that very plain in the beginning. The chapter 1 of uh, John, uh, verse 17, where it says that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The law came by Moses to show what was wrong with us. But the law doesn't fix us. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The schoolmaster that reveals what is wrong and broken so that we might come to Jesus, who is our Savior, who can fix what is broken, who can heal what is sick about us, who can mend what is divided within us. The law, they're saying we're Moses' authority. Now, they had off the already said something very similar. They said, we're of Jacob. And Jacob, of course, is the one whose name is changed to Israel. But Jacob built wells. He dug wells. He dug a well in Sychar. And, and that's great. But Jesus gives the living water. You see the difference? And then you have Abraham. Well, Abraham, he cast a, a, a servant who was a slave out. And what's Jesus do? Jesus sets the servants free. And we have Moses. Moses who says that he is a prophet. And yet there's going to be a prophet far greater, Moses said. They're now rejecting the prophet Moses spoke about. Jesus gives grace and truth that the law exposes where we are divided. Paul 
makes an interesting statement in 1 Corinthians 6. He says that uh, he hears at the, uh, and, and it's, it's in the very beginning of Corinthians, he hears there's a division among the brethren there at Corinth. And, and he says there's contentions even, contentions where it's vicious among Christians. And, and he says, some of you say you're of Paul, some say you're of Apollos, some say you're of Cephas, some even say you're of Christ as if you're better than everybody else. And then Paul says, is Christ divided? The word denomination, namas is the word for name, D is the word of, of the name, that we want to call ourselves Calvinists, Wesleyans, we want to call ourselves Lutherans. Luther asked the same question. He said, did Luther die for you? Was Luther's blood shed for you? Luther said, let no man be called Lutheran. My dear ones, I don't care who it is that has brought you to faith in Christ and introduced you to the Lord Jesus. They're a servant of God. No man is to be worshipped. We are followers of disciples of Jesus Christ. Paul himself said to the Philippians, be followers of me, even as I'm a follower of Christ. And so consequently, when they say we're of Moses, they're cutting themselves short and they're following a man rather than following God. Jesus is more than a man. Jesus is God who became a man. So now in verse 29, they say, we know that God spoke, and that word spoke, they have in the perfect tense, and that means they, he spoke, and it continues to this day to speak. Now, that is true. God has spoken through Moses, and the law continues to speak. But again, I remind you, it's a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The last day, Jesus has already said in John chapter 5, verse 45 and 46, he has said there is going to be one that will judge you, and that is Moses himself, though speaking the writings of Moses. Moses is a witness of Christ. And if you reject Christ, you're rejecting the writings of the Torah. You're rejecting not just the, 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 the Torah, you're also rejecting all of the writings, you're rejecting the prophets. And all scripture is speaking of one, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what they go on to say. We know, it's emphatic, we know God spoke. Now, what they don't know, and they're making an admission, and it's actually ironically true, they don't know. But they're not even giving this this person that they reject, the dignity of calling him by name. Instead, in the Greek, if you have your Bible, you may find words, as for this fellow, the word as for is in italics, that's not in the Greek. The word fellow, that's not in the Greek. In other words, it would be translated simply this. As for this, he's not even given a pronoun. It's not him. It's not he. It's simply an object. This. There is such a vicious, viperous hatred for Jesus. Why? Men hate God because God is holy. God exposes our sin. So now, they say, we don't know where he's from. The nature of lies, the nature of Satan, is inconsistency. They are saying in chapter 7, we know where he's from. They think he's from Nazareth. We know his parents. We know Joseph and Mary. Yes, they think they know there, but now in chapter 9, they say, we don't know, because that's the nature of a lie. But the nature of truth is that it's always the same. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So how will people know that you're a Christian? 
I pray that they know you as a Christian by your love, even toward those that hate you, by your courage and your boldness to speak about Jesus publicly, and finally, by the wisdom that God has given you through his word and by his spirit. Let's pray. Thank you, O Father, that we do not speak with the wisdom of men, but with the power of God by your Holy Spirit. We pray if there is any that hear this meditation and do not know the Lord Jesus, have not confessed their sin and acknowledged him as their Savior, we pray that now, even in this moment, they might do that. And if we're Christians, we pray, O oh Father, that we, like the early church, might be given boldness by your Spirit, and that we do not fear what man would do. We fear only God, in whose holy name we pray. Amen.